holes here at first. There's a crib. Um, she was a volunteer at first uh, when I was really young, and then she started working as a librarian uh, more, more often as I grew up. So that means that I spent a good share of time at the library when I was a kid. It was also right down the street, or right next door to our church, and we spent a lot of time in our church, so I did spend many afternoons after school and other times at the library. Uh, this is the Carmichael Library. This is the library that I spent time at. Those are the doors I went into all the time. And this library had a large children's section. Uh, the children's section was about half of the library, and so I had lots of books to be able to choose from, which would make you think that I was a prolific reader as a kid, which I was not. Uh, there were only a few series that I was interested in, and it was like pulling teeth sometimes to get me to read anything different than just those series of books. One of my favorite series was the Choose Your Own Adventure books. Anybody remember those? Yes. Love these books. Choose Your Own Adventures are so much fun. Uh, what I don't remember about Choose Your Own Adventures are the characters, the plots, the lessons they taught, uh, the morals, you know, anything about them at all. Other than just the fact that you get to choose your own adventure. Um, so here's a little map to show you how some of these books work. Uh, somebody did a map on this book, The Mystery of Chimney Rock, and they mapped out all the different choices you could make and the endings that it could lead you to through the book. So just, just in case you don't, you're not familiar, you need to get in the, the be a groupie of the Choose Your Own Adventure books. Um, you start reading the first couple pages to set the scene for the story, and after you get in a few pages, there's a question or an issue or a point of confusion for the character, and it poses the question. You know, if you decide to choose this, turn to page 24. If you choose to do this, turn to page 68. And then you go to that page and you get another situation and you respond to it another way and it feeds you in all these different places. Now, for example, The Mystery of Chimney Rock has 44 different choices you can make throughout the book and it has 36 different endings that you could get to. Just in this one book. And how cool is that? You know, there's 36 short stories in this one book. So if you don't like one of the endings, you know, just choose another one and be like, oh, I want to go this way. And that's a lot more fun. And you can find your own adventure. The Gospel of Mark is a lot like a Choose Your Own Adventure book. Particularly when it comes to the end of the book. Uh, here's a picture of the last page of Mark in my Bible, which is just like your Bible. At the end of Mark, it comes to verse 8 in chapter 16 in the top left corner, and then after that there's this funny little line, and after that there's a warning, and at least the warning in my Bible says, the most ancient manuscripts of Mark conclude with verse 8, later manuscripts add one or both of the following endings, and then we find a few more verses that are called the shorter ending, and then we found a lot more verses which are creatively called the longer ending. And these are two different endings that have been added into Mark. And I think the ending for Mark that we choose is very important for our faith. Because it gives us another angle to see the big picture that we've been talking about. It teaches us some things about God and about ourselves depending on which ending we choose. And the end is extremely important. Now, the ending of Mark and the ending of all the Gospels focuses on one major event. The end of all the Gospels culminates with what major event? Crucifixion and then the burial and resurrection. It's all about the resurrection. And I do realize, which I hope you do as well, that today is not Easter. <laughs> But is it okay to still talk about the resurrection today? Can we do that? Okay, good, because we're kind of a resurrection people. That's sort of where we get our faith. So, we're going to talk about the resurrection. Um, if it feels weird to talk about the resurrection today, just wait until after the sermon when we sing Jesus Christ is risen today. And then you'll feel really strange. But we're going to do it, so. <laughs> now, uh, for those of us... Uh, 
Now, even though it's not Easter, though, I think it's important to talk about the resurrection. And I think it's the perfect time to actually talk about the resurrection because we have a little bit more freedom since it's not Easter. Because on Easter, there's sort of this feeling and this thing you're supposed to be celebrating. And if you don't celebrate the big, powerful, exciting ending, then it doesn't feel like Easter. But since we're not on Easter, we can talk about some of the other lesser known or lesser used passages that do celebrate Easter, but just in a little bit different way. And that is Mark. So let's start with the books about Jesus. Uh, so basic things to begin with. There are, there are four books, correct, about Jesus, four biographies about Jesus, and they are? Good. Uh, they always appear in this order. They never appear in a different order in our Bibles. It's always Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. And ever since the 4th century, the church father, um, Augustine, popularized the understanding that this is the order in which the books were written. So the idea was Matthew was earliest, and then Mark, and then Luke, and then John was the last written. So that's why they were put in that order. Of course, in the last hundred years or so, people have realized that that's probably not the case, that Mark was actually written first, and then Matthew and Luke, and then John after that. Not that it makes a whole lot of difference for believing in Jesus, but that's probably the order in which they were written. There's also some other differences between the Gospels, because they're not exa exactly the same. Matthew is a fairly long Gospel. Mark, super short. Luke, longest one of all, and John, kind of average in length. So they're totally different lengths. Some take a long time to read, some take a short time to read. They are not all the same. They're also different in terms of their style. You know, if you've read through them and you've compared them in any way, you know that they use different language, that some pick and choose from stories, some exclude stories that the others include. They're different in their approach. So if we all, let's say after the church service, decided to go home and write one page about what happened in church this morning, would all the things that we wrote be exactly the same? No, of course not, because we're all different people and we all notice different things. Some people would say, that was a horrible sermon, and other people say, it was great. So we say different things about the experiences that we have, and the same thing is true for the gospel writers. They looked at the same situations in the same era when Jesus lived, and they wrote different things about it, because they saw it, they observed it differently, and God uses their voices to teach us different things about him. Well, when it comes to the ending of all the four gospels, all four include the event of the resurrection. It's, it's good enough, it's important enough, it's valuable enough that they all include it. But, not in the same way. Um, for example, at Easter we love to talk about Matthew's ending to the Gospel. We love to talk about Matthew's ending to the resurrection and that story because I call this one the ride off into the sunset Gospel. This is uh, when Jesus charges them as they're riding off into the sunset, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. I mean, you have this feeling that there's this charge to go off and do these great things. And so that's the triumphant message at the end of Matthew. At Easter, we also love to talk about Luke, because Luke is what we call the self-discovery ending. This is when, after Jesus is raised from the dead, there's some two guys walking along the street, and Jesus mysteriously comes up next to them, and they don't know it's him. And all of a sudden, over those hours talking with them, they self-discover that it's Jesus. And you have this moment of realizing, wow, this is Jesus, and great things can happen. And there's the ending. We also like John, and we like John because um, John is the one that we could call the party ending. If you remember at the end of John, uh, the guys are fishing and they're not doing so hot. And Jesus is on the shore and says, go cast your nets on the other side of the boat. And they do, and what do they find? The biggest catch of fish they've ever had. And so they come in and they celebrate, they have breakfast, and it's like a party at the end. Is Mark like this? No. Mark does not get invited to Easter very often. Because Mark does not have the same kind of ending that Matthew and Luke 
and John's tend to have. There's no party. There's no right up into the sunset. There's no moment of discovery about the great things God has done, like we get the feeling in the other Gospels. So what is it about Mark? Um, by about the 5th or 6th centuries, some of the church leaders who were reading the Gospels, they saw this difference between Mark and the others. And after reading the others and thinking, wow, this is great stuff, and then they read Mark and think, what's he missing? They decided to add in some better endings to Mark. They decided to add some improved feelings to the end of Mark because it didn't end in the right way. So it's highly likely, there are people who don't agree with this, but for the most part, people agree that, the, that in the 5th or 6th centuries, people started adding some endings to Mark. And they came up with these shorter endings and longer endings that added a nice wrapping and bow to the end of the story to make it feel better, to make it end better, to make it end more like the others. So what's the big deal then about the shorter ending that stops in verse 8? Let's find out. Here's the last eight verses of the Gospel of Mark. Saturday evening, when the Sabbath ended, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome went out and purchased burial spices so they could anoint Jesus' body. Very early on Sunday morning, just at sunrise, just at sunrise, they went to the tomb. On the way, they were asking each other, who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance to the tomb? But as they arrived, they looked up and saw that the stone, which was very large, had already been rolled aside. When they entered the tomb, they saw a young man clothed in a white robe sitting on the right side. The women were shocked, but the angel said, don't be alarmed. You are looking for Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He isn't here. He has risen from the dead. Look, this is where they laid his body. Now go and tell his disciples, including Peter, that Jesus is going ahead of you to Galilee. You will see him there just as he told you before he died. The women fled from the tomb, trembling and bewildered, and they said nothing to anyone because they were too frightened. Now, if this was a choose-your-own-adventure book, it might say, if the women go to bed and wake up the next morning and tell people about Jesus, turn to page 49. If the women are silent, stop here. Mark stops. That's the end of the story for Mark. Mark has a unique way of telling the story of Jesus. All the way through his gospel, he has unique language, and he has unique forms of talking about Jesus. So why wouldn't Mark have unique ways of talking about Jesus, even at the end of this book? Mark, I think, all the way to the very end, has some very special things to teach us about God and who God made us to be, contributing to our big picture that we're talking about. Um, I have to laugh sometimes when I read through the Gospel of Mark because the Gospel of Mark uh, feels like it's hurried, like he's, like he's a tour guide who's trying to push you through the tour to get on to the next tour. You've had one of those before? They're, they show you one thing and they say, okay, come on, let's go on to the next thing. Okay, we're done here, let's go on to the next thing. You think, well, I haven't even looked at the thing you just talked to me about. That's Mark. He's constantly pushing us to the next thing because his favorite word is immediately. Everything is immediately. And his second favorite word is amazing. Everything is amazing to Mark. I mean, he's got this hurried spirit, this amazing spirit, but he's just rushing through his gospel. And, and all the way up to the end, all the way into the resurrection story, he's rushing there, and it's a short story. And he's amazed by these things, and we get to be amazed by his ending. So even when we get to the end, Jesus, when Jesus is raised from the dead, we have this fast-paced feeling. The stones roll away. The women are shocked. They see this angel in the sky, and they hear the instructions. The angel says what to do. And nothing that they see is anything like they expected to see. And that's all they get. That's all we get. Jesus isn't there to reassure them that everything's going to be okay, and they can just take a break for a day and then move on, and everything will be fine. Nobody tells them what to do. And now they just have to figure it out. And I love it because it just fits. It fits with who Mark is. And it fits with the style, the form that Mark has, and the message that Mark is trying to give us. 
Because I think Mark's thrust is that if we're in a relationship with Jesus, just as the disciples were, if we're in this relationship with Jesus where we're trying to follow Jesus, then what does Jesus always do, even up to the end of his resurrection? Jesus keeps us on our toes. And he does, doesn't he? I mean, at least for Mark it's true. He's constantly pushing us to see this next thing. And don't get too comfy because guess what's next? I mean, we're always on our toes. And if we're in a relationship with God, if we're Jesus, don't relationships keep, the, keep us on our toes? I mean, yeah, every day's not the same. And there's some wonderful, awesome things that happen. And there's some confusing things that happen. And we are constantly on our toes trying to keep up with what Jesus is doing. This reminds me of uh, what Jesus said to people who were believing in him and following him. He said, you are truly my disciples if you remain faithful to my teachings and you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Free from routines, freedom from dullness, freedom from just boredom and faith. This is alive, new, fresh, keep on your toes kind of faith. A dynamic, growing, deep relationship with Jesus keeps us on our toes. And that's something that Mark teaches us about what it means to be in a relationship with God. So how about for us? If that's what we learn about God, that it's a dynamic and real and on-your-toes relationship, what about us? What does Mark want us to see about ourselves, about the people God made us to be? Well, let's go back to the ending. What's the last thing that happens? What's the last event at the end of chapter 16 in verse 8? This is the reason Mark is not well-liked. Because what happens? The women hear, and then what do they do? Nothing! They don't do what they're told. They don't respond. They run away because they're what? They're terrified. They're scared. They're frightened. They have no idea what to do. They, and remember, they've gotten to the tomb. The stone's rolled away. It's an amazing moment. They see an angel, this guy who gives them instructions about specifically what to do and where to go and what Jesus is doing. And the rule of thumb, I think, throughout the Bible when an angel appears to somebody is to usually say, okay, I'll do it. Because you're from God, you're giving me a message, I think I should probably do this. And in this case, they don't do what the angel says. They run away. The women are frightened. It says the women fled from the tomb, trembling and bewildered, and they said nothing to anyone because they were too frightened. Now that's not the epic, victorious, power-packed kind of ending of the other Gospels. This is Mark, and that's, this is not necessarily what we want to see in here when we're trying to follow Jesus, who's done the greatest miracle ever just now. Matthew, Luke, and John say that the women of the tomb were filled with fear and joy. Mark says they were filled with fear. He doesn't allude to the joy part. He's only focusing on the fear. And throughout the Gospel of Mark, if we look at the times when people observe something that God had done and they were frightened, or when they were frightened, they see that it, they had just been through an event when God had done something. There's this connection between people being fearful, people being frightened, and something that God has just done. The women were frightened because of a huge, miraculous, never-before-happened event that God had just done. They were frightened. And they didn't tell anybody. Uh, when we lived in Southern California, before we moved up here, uh, we were invited to a fundraising dinner, fundraising event for Fuller Seminary, which is where I went to seminary. And so it was after I had graduated, and we recently graduated, and they invited us back to be part of the alumni fundraising group. So we got invited, and we were tempted to go because the event was at one of those old historic houses in Pasadena on Orange Grove Avenue, kind of right by the Rose Parade House. And, you know, we're suckers for that kind of thing, so we thought, eh, yeah, why not? So we responded, and we went. Uh, the house was one of these... Houses was basically turned into a museum. So we went through the museum beforehand and enjoyed seeing all that stuff. And then they invited all the people who were there, about 60 of us, 
into this dining room in the house. And we sat down at tables and we were served dinner and we enjoyed talking with the people at the table and getting to know them. And then the program began. And the program consisted of five or six individuals and groups that were students currently at Fuller Seminary talking about where they came from and how they got there and uh, their family background and their life and the provision that God had made to get them to Fuller. And they were all incredible stories. I mean, they were multicultural. They were all over the world. You learned so many things about different cultures and different lifestyles and different people. And it was like a culture lesson and a history lesson. And it was a great reminder of the amazing things that God had done in these people's lives to provide for them to be there. So after they were done, somebody official got up and they thanked us for coming and they said goodnight. And we sat there looking at each other thinking, yeah, you're missing something. Like, where's the big pitch? You know, are we supposed to bring out our checkbooks, write a check, put it in the envelope, leave it on the table, it's all secure? I mean, that's how it's supposed to be. And we're like, they didn't do it. Do you think we gave to Fuller Seminary that night? Oh, we did! Because we so wanted to be part of what God was doing in those students' lives. We were like excited hearing these stories. And that's Mark. He leaves us wanting to be part of this thing because who's going to do it if it's not us? Because we're sure the women didn't do it. So Mark is inviting us in to say, if they're not going to tell the story about Jesus, then who is? Jesus wants us to keep on our toes. But the thing we might learn about us is that God wants us to just step in. Step in and tell the stories. Step in and share what Jesus has done in our lives. Step in and share the things that we realize that God has done. Because that needs to be told over and over again. So what is the best ending for Mark? I think the best ending is us. I mean, when we share our stories, when we talk about Jesus, when we live like Jesus, when we try to follow Jesus, that's the best ending. Because Jesus wants us to be part of it. Let's pray.